Ephesians 4, verses 1 through 3, and preaching just on verse 3. This is St. Paul speaking the word of God. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit, in the bond of peace. You may be seated. Our great God and Savior, work in our hearts that eagerness, that desire to maintain that unity of spirit, the bond of peace that you have bestowed upon those of us who are your children. And if any here do not know you as their child, may this be the day you reveal to them their need of the Savior, work in their hearts true repentance and faith, where they call upon you for salvation and know they are now your child forever. In the name of Christ, our Savior, who bought our salvation, in his name we pray, amen. Well, I'm a child of the 60s, grew up 60s and 70s. If you remember that time, what was the universal symbol everybody gave? Peace. Yep, calls for peace, calls for unity. It was a really tough time in America. Drugs, war racial division, especially growing up in the South, saw that firsthand. Not really new, though. Look back 40 years to the 20s, just after World War II, the Great War, World War I, and that call for peace and this ecumenical movement that spread across Anglicanism and many other denominations. But that wasn't new either. You go back another 50 years, Reconstruction, in America, boy, what a tough time, much hatred. Go back a few years before that, people trying to avert, avert, avert the Civil War. How can we make peace? We could just go on and on and on. And we look around us today, go any closer. Special interest groups, different, different ethnic and socio-political groups, clamoring, asking for identification, for acceptance, for toleration, worldwide micro-wars. There's this great inability to meet, to talk, to discuss, to find consensus. And we're no closer to peace today than we were 6,000 years ago when we were expelled from the garden. A continual chorus since antiquity. Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, the last prophet of major significance before the fall of Judah, talked about peace a lot. They have healed the wound of my people lightly, saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. We looked for peace, but no good came for time of healing. But behold, terror. Their tongue is a deadly arrow. It speaks deceitfully. With his mouth, each speaks peace to his neighbor. But in his heart, he plans an ambush for him. Our passage today is a call from the apostle for peace and unity. But it's a call for a true peace and a unity that come only by the Spirit, only by the working of God. Paul continues to build up, build upon the call he made in verse 1 to walk in a manner worthy of our calling, remembering that it is God himself who is calling you and it is God himself who is equipping you, equipping us with his fruits. We saw last week those fruits of humility and gentleness and patience and forbearance and love. Now we are to be walking eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bonds of peace. 
a short verse, only six major words, but oh, so important for our continual ability to walk in the Spirit, to walk worthy of the manner that we've been called. Two major commands here for two different gifts that we've been given. If you remember in chapters 1 and through 3, there were only two commands given, and they were both centered around a unity, talking about Jews and Gentiles now being one in the body and how they are to live together. And so far in chapter 4, in these first three verses, we've seen eight commands. Eight commands. But let us not forget the groundwork that Paul laid in chapters 1 through 3. Who are you? How do you live? You are a person that has been created in Christ Jesus. You are to live your life in the power of Christ, not in your own power. We were once dead, now we're alive. We were once children of wrath, Now we're children of God. We once walked according to the world that is in darkness. Now we walk in good works. That is the light of God. We were enemies of each other. Now we're united in Christ. And he starts off by saying, eager to maintain. Two commands we are given. Let's examine them a little bit closer. Eager. You think of that word, what do you think of? A lot of us probably think eager beaver. (laughs) And that kind of makes sense because beavers are industrious. Eager, to be enthusiastic. Actually, it has a dual meaning, though. To make haste, to be prompt, but also to be diligent, to exert oneself, to strive. In the NIV, it says make every effort. Make every effort. Every effort. Does that describe us as believers? As those set free from sin and now able to serve those around us? Are we eager, looking for every opportunity to do God's work, to be His children, to walk worthily? Putting these two definitions of eager together, to make haste and to be diligent, gives us a powerful command. It refocuses the immediacy of our calling, something I think we all struggle with. In Matthew chapter 21, there's the parable of the two sons. For me, it was a son and a daughter. What do you think? A man had two sons, and he went to the first and said, Son, go and work in the vineyard today. And he said, I will not. But afterwards, he changed his mind and went. And he went to the other son and said the same. And he answered, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of the Father? They said the first. Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes go into the kingdom of heaven before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, but you did not believe him but the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. Son number two says yes, but disobeys. Son number one, initial disobedience, but then repents and obeys, listens to that call of God, confesses his sin, and moves into obedience. Eager is that same word that's used in 2 Timothy 2.15. Study to show yourself approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, rightly handling or rightly dividing the word of truth. In the Son, that represents in the one who diligently searches the Scriptures. The one who obeys, seeking after God, obeying God diligently. And what does that produce in that son? But true joy, true contentment. Jesus said, but he said, blessed are there other those who hear the word of God and keep it. And Jesus answered them in John 14, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word 
and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Then it says we're to be eager to maintain. This is the second verb given in this verse. And notice both of these verbs are active verbs. They're not passive. They're not optional. They're not for a certain class of believers. They're not just for the pastor or the elders or the deacons and deaconesses, those who serve officially in the church, but for all believers. And it means to we, we are to attend carefully to our task, to our calling, to persevere, to keep our eyes on Christ. It's actually a military term in antiquity, and even now, if you were given the responsibility of being a watchman or a prison guard, what happened if you were lax or negligent? Remember when Peter's in prison under Herod, and miraculously the angel come and releases him? What does Herod do to the prison guards? Has them executed on the spot. And God says to Ezekiel, think of yourself as the watchman for the city. When you hear my word, proclaim it. And if you don't, you're like the watchman that is asleep or the watchman that sees the enemy coming and doesn't warn the people and you will be held to account. Notice the pattern here. Paul repeating himself. Humility, gentleness, patience, forbearance, and now eagerness in maintaining. Paul doubling up for emphasis the importance of these commands that he's given to us. Paul knows how much we struggle. Not just occasionally, but pretty much 24-7, 365. Knowing how much the world's call of the sirens seems to entrap us, seems to shipwreck, want to shipwreck us. And knowing how much Satan works to sidetrack and to destroy us, to be eager, to maintain. But what, what for? What's the end? What's the purpose? To have unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Unity and peace, probably two of the graces of our salvation that are the hardest to maintain. They are so easily squandered, so easily, so readily set aside by our own sin our pride, our harshness of spirit, our impatience to see God's work done. We want to see our work done, our lack of love. Oh, those are the things in verse 2, humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another in love. Instead, we substitute that pride, harshness, and patience. We are to have unity in the spirit. Biblical unity, which is not just uniformity. There will be differences of ministry style, expression. I really learned to see this in the past two or three years. Um, Being in the Reformed tradition for 20 years, we're very tightly wrapped. And we are very much, we want to see our doctrine perfect, and we want to just sit in nice rows in churches and sing nice hymns. And then I got to meet a lot of people from other cultures, African-American, Asian, Hispanic. And you can't drop this, that kind of worship style into a culture that's never heard the gospel before, that has no paradigm to understand that. I saw that in Africa when I was there 15, 10 years ago and saw the pastor leading the worship with a drum. And it was wonderful to hear the singing of those people and the worship. Would it fit in here? Maybe, maybe not. But trying to force that on, it's not going to be a uniformity. There will be differences in ministry style. That doesn't mean we cater to the world. We still bring the gospel. And biblical unity is not just limited to having a loving and tolerant attitude, although that is part of it. But biblical unity is an agreement on the core essentials of the faith, the doctrine of God, who God is, the doctrine of salvation, who Christ is, what Christ has done. And it's putting aside that which would divide us. 
I could list dozens of things that would divide us. They may be very important doctrines, but are they worth breaking fellowship over? Well, I can't go to your church because you believe that. Remembering that Christ has united us who were once enemies. We were enemies of God and we were enemies of each other. Jews, Gentiles, 250 years ago, Tories, Patriots. 175 years ago and on, black and white. Currently, left wing, right wing. It may mean calling those back to the faith who have erred, but that has to be done lovingly, humbly, gently, patiently. If you go to somebody that's erred in error and just start blasting them with how they're wrong, I think that's going to go over. Not well. Not just tolerating, but truly loving. Not just tolerating, but truly loving. Having joy in each other's presence. That's one thing I just love about this church. And I don't, I'm not trying to pat you on the back. But there is a true joy and a love for each other here. Never let that go. Christ has great joy in making you His child. Should we not have that same joy in uniting with our brothers and sisters? We are not to create this unity. This unity is the result of the finished work done by Christ to defeat death. And it's applied by the Holy Spirit to His believers. It's applied into our hearts. How does this unity come about? It's through the bond of peace. This bond, this binding, which is done only in the power of the Spirit, it's done with such power that it takes that which was once disparate or pulls apart and unites it as one. And it happened in Ephesus with Jews and Gentiles. It's happening in the churches with blacks and whites, with rich poor, with left-wing Christians, with right-wing Christians. It's Christ doing it. <coughs> and the same bond, the same power, it's the power that raised Christ from the dead. The same power that Christ, that God the Father used to raise His Son. Joining them into one body, producing true spirit-driven, spirit-initiated, spirit-governed, spirit-fed, Spirit-maintained peace. And if you remember from a few months ago, we'd, peace was defined in the Scriptures as that tranquil state of a soul assured of its salvation through Christ and so fearing nothing from God and content with its earthly lot of whatsoever sort that is. The tranquil state of the soul assured of its salvation, fearing nothing from God, no recriminations from past sins, no recrimination for the sins you commit now with repentance, content with your earthly lot of whatsoever sort that is. A peace like that unity, we do not produce that on our own. This is a peace that's, again, like the unity, result of the finished work of Christ. The defeat death applied to us by His Holy Spirit in our hearts. We've covered a lot of theology in the past four weeks. We looked at a passage from Exodus to bridge between chapters 1 through 3 and 4 through 6, where we learned about God has made us priest to minister to minister to each other, to minister to the world around us, to glorify God as His priest. And we learned three weeks ago about being called to walk and to do so in a worthy manner. And then we've learned about the fruits that God has given us in this walk to sustain us, this humility, this gentleness, this patience, this forbearance, this love to help us walk in a worthy manner. And we're to do it eagerly and diligently. With all diligence. Making every effort. And yet, 
we look around, we don't always see what God has sown, do we? That is, that true godly unity and biblical peace in our hearts or in our families or in our churches. We recall the lamentations of Jeremiah, peace, peace, but there is no peace. Do we give up? Do we settle for less? Do we lose hope? Do we think this is an ideal that's unobtainable, <coughs> only there for the super saints, maybe the pastors or the elders? <laughs> Far from it. Your pastor does not produce true peace and unity in his heart. It has to come from the Spirit. Again, we must return to God. Again, we must return to the gospel. For all the promises of God find their yes in Him, Paul says to the Corinthian church. That is why it is through Him we utter our amen to God for His glory. Peter tells us, by which He has granted to us precious and very great promises, so that through them you might become partakers of the divine nature. Partakers of the divine nature. You don't become God, but God gives you some sense of that peace, that unity, that love, that humility, that patience, that gentleness. Partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. And I love how Moses puts it in the book of Deuteronomy. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us, and our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. The secret things belong to the Lord our God. There's some things I will never understand. Some things we will never know. Why is God doing what he's doing? Why did that spouse die? Why did this child get sick? Why did I lose my job? Why am I this? Why that? Sometimes God will not reveal it. But the things that He has revealed belong to us and our children forever. Think about that. The promises of God in Christ. He will save you. He will walk with you. He will sustain you. He will never leave you or forsake you. Belong to you and your children forever so that we can just sit around and haven't eaten bonbons and strumming on harps. No, so that we may do all the words of this law, so that we may glorify God in everything that we think, say, and do. The same gospel that worked into our hearts true repentance will evermore work true repentance into our hearts when we sin. I think of David in that great psalm, have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. Was this David calling out for his salvation, his conversion? No, he was already a true believer. He'd fallen into sin, but God worked repentance in his heart and restored him. That same God that worked in our hearts, true faith and repentance at our conversion, is that same God that worked in David's heart and will work in our hearts, will give us that same gospel again. How can we be sure of this? We want to think about Jeremiah and that peace that was lost. Think about Isaiah. He was a prophet too, and he came to talk about peace. Isaiah is often called the fifth gospel. He talks about Christ more than any other prophet of the Old Testament, the coming Messiah. Come one that would bring continual peace not a political peace or a military peace or a superficial religious peace, but a peace that goes right to the core of our beings. A peace that can only come from God because it is God himself bringing this priest, uh, peace through the Prince of Peace. 
He says in Isaiah 9, For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Or in Isaiah 26, O Lord, you will ordain peace for us where you have indeed done for all our works. Isaiah 53, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds you are healed. I just can't fathom why God would do that. His son beaten and humiliated and die for us, for our peace. For the mountains may depart and the hills be removed, but my steadfast love shall not depart from you. And my covenant of peace shall not be removed, says the Lord, who has compassion on you. Compassion on you. Compassion when you're a widow or a widower. Compassion when you're childless. Compassion when your children walk away from the Lord. Compassion when you're ill. For thus says the Lord, Behold, I will extend peace to her like a river, and the glory of the nations like an overflowing stream, and you shall nurse. You shall be carried upon her hip, and bounced upon her knees. In every covenant that God has made with man, who has broken the peace? It's always us. But in every covenant God has made with man, who is initiated with peace? It's God. And who restores that peace in every covenant when we break it? It's always the Father. Even before we knew we needed peace, before we knew we needed forgiveness, before we needed, knew we needed reconciliation, God was at work. Take heart today in the work of Christ. Take comfort again in the gospel of peace that brings unity with the Savior. Our Father and our God, may we always walk in this peace, walk in this unity walking in gentleness, humility, patience, forbearance, and love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace through our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.